constantly and consistently um, throughout the week. I have a couple of quick announcements as we begin. Ladies, um, tonight we have kind of an Advent kickoff at 6 o'clock for you. Um, Y'all gathered a couple times over the course of the fall. Um, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're just inviting all, all the ladies um, up here for a time of worship and teaching um, and to just kind of kick off the Advent season. There'll be child care um, for kiddos 10 and down. And so would love for you to be um, here for that. In the box on the back wall next to the TV back there, there are some Advent guides. Those are not just for the women. There's one for every family. And it's just a, a, a resource or a tool for you and your family um, this December, um, maybe to, to meet with Jesus on the regular as we celebrate this season. And then a second announcement real quick. Um, on Monday, December the 12th, going to have our annual Christmas party. Um, we're going to do it again at the Bowling Alley like we've done um, a couple times in the past. It'll be a potluck and it'll be free for you just to come and to enjoy the hangout together that evening. We'll be sending out more information on how to know what to bring, whether it's sweet or savory. Um, we'll make sure you have that information, but we'd love for you to come. Um, we'll have it that evening for a couple hours and so just enjoy that time together. And then finally this morning, this is the first um, Sunday of Advent. Advent is the season, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And as we celebrate, what we're celebrating is the fact that, that Jesus has come and ultimately that he's coming again. Right? That both of those things are true. And yet we know that Israel waited for some 400 years where there was silence before they had, when they had heard from the last prophet until Jesus had set foot on earth. There was a lot of waiting and wondering. And so we celebrate some of the themes throughout the month. And so one of the things we're going to do um, is we're going to continue to preach through Luke. But we're going to begin each Sunday during this season with um, an individual or family um, from the church. Just kind of speaking about how Jesus has been that week's kind of theme to them over the course of this last year. And the, and the, the theme of the first week of Advent is hope. Right, that, that they were hoping and waiting and anticipating the Messiah stepping into the scene. And so this morning, the Taylor, Sean, Lori, Beth, and little Abram are just going to share how Jesus has been hope for them this year. So as Jeremy said, my name is Sean Taylor, this is Lori, Beth, and this is our baby boy, Abram. Um, thinking about hope in relation to this past year, I think it's... When we found out we were pregnant, there's a lot of hope that comes with that and, and wanting the best for your child and wanting the best for your wife during pregnancy. And we were met with a lot of sickness during pregnancy and a lot of difficulties in the midst of that and found out pretty quickly that that's not where we can place our hope and that's not where I can rest and find hope is uh, how well Lori Beth does day to day during pregnancy or even how well Abram does after he's born. Um, when he's born uh, with his heart not beating and not breathing, it's very hard to, to, to find hope in that and to, to realize like everything is temporary, even the birth of your child and even the life of your child. And finding that out uh, at 
soon as he's born, uh, quickly reveals to you how much we need a hope that lasts and a hope that's eternal. And uh, in God, we have been given a gift through Jesus of an eternal hope and a living hope that lasts. And in 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So this morning we light the hope candle, knowing that our ultimate hope should be found in Jesus Christ. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, we don't want to take it for granted that we have hope this morning. Hope that's sure, hope that's lasting, um, hope that allows us to stand on solid ground. I'm thanking that, that hope has a name. Um, Lord, that we can know you, we can know your name. So Lord, we ask you to minister, to reveal, to speak this morning through your word as it's prayed, your word as it's, as it's spoken, your word as it's read, your word as it's sung, as it's preached, and even as we interact with one another. God, would you um, stir our affection for you? Would we trust and depend upon you? Lord, would we be grateful for the fact that you have come? And would we hope in the fact that you are coming again? Lord, we need you. We ask you to speak. Your church is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Y'all stand with us this morning. Let's sing together.
we could not attain peace with you by any other way um, than by the blood of your son, Jesus. And we come today um, just grateful for that mercy, grateful that, um, that you sent your son at the right time to a people whose hearts were ready um, in a place where um, so many things were happening that would affect the entire uh, course of history. Um, God, and you knew that exact timing, just like you know the exact timing of what we're going through and what we're facing even today. Um, Lord, you see us, you know us, um, each one of us deeply and, um, and intimately. You walk with us, um, and you give us each day what we need, if only we will just look to you. Um, God, you are an overflowing fountain today of hope and of satisfaction, and would you help us to seek those things in you today and in nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Our littlest guys are dismissed on this hall room for child care. And our big kids will be in here with us this morning. They don't have a lot. So there are some little like worship notebook folder things at the front here by the stage and over here by the stage if they want to grab one. Um, and they'll be in here with us following along with the sermon. Things and basically saying you need to settle your accounts with God, right, before you meet Him. 
right? You need to make things right, and we do that right through Jesus. And while this conversation is taking place, basically someone hollers out from the crowd, um, and, and potentially this was kind of, you know, their equivalent of breaking news, right? And this was probably a very recent event, and someone hollers out, you heard about what Rome did to the Galileans. Right, they were on their way to sacrifice. They were in the process of sacrificing, and they were slaughtered. Right, and not only were they slaughtered, not only did Pilate show utter disdain for human life, but then he mixed their blood that was spilt with the sacrifices that they were already making. It was disdain for religion and for uh, and for people. Like you heard what Pilate did, Jesus. Like, what are you going to say about that? Now, listen, we don't know the motive or the intent. Um, behind this person. It could have simply been someone who has heard the news and they very much are wanting to hear Jesus answer and, and, and speak to this, going, hey, you've been saying some hard things, but the Galileans, those are your people. You don't, you're not meaning that they deserve this, right? Or potentially, it was those who were trying to spur Jesus on. They're still thinking it's going to be an earthly kingdom brought by military might, right? And they're going, maybe, maybe if he hears this atrocious heinous thing has occurred, Jesus will stop this nonsense and we will march on Jerusalem. Or it could have been that someone's going, man, if we, if we kind of give him some, some nationalistic speech here, he may say something that will take him off of our hands and he'll become Rome's problem because we can't figure out how to deal with it. Right? Like there's, there's all sorts of things that could have been going on as the crowd is hearing this and what they're hoping that Jesus will say. But if you remember last week, as we finished the last chapter 12, he says, listen, it, he gives the, the story. He says, if you were going before the courts and you owed a debt, you would be a fool not to make it right before you get there. <laughs> Saying, you have a debt before God. You would be a fool not to deal with it when there's one there to deal with it. And, and it's, in, it's me. You don't want to go before God and stand in your guilt alone without an advocate. And so this is kind of the, the setting where Jesus is now going to answer the question. And so he hears this heinous thing. And his response is a little bit shocking. And he says, do you not think those, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the others? Because they suffered in this way. Why, why is he asking that question? Because in this day and age, and honestly, it is permeated and still here, that there is a tendency to want to draw a straight line from someone's sin, or the amount of sin, or the, um, the type of sin, to their suffering. Right? That we want to say, if they're suffering in that way, what did they do to deserve it? That they've done something to draw that sort of ire or attention from God. Right? Like, we, we, we want to do that, even if we know we shouldn't. But Scripture is far more complicated, right, in how it deals with suffering than that. It's not a simple, quick answer. We see in Scripture that there are some where there is um, suffering, and it's so that the glory of God will be revealed in that moment. There are others that their suffering is a natural consequence of living in a broken world. There are some, right, whose suffering is judgment. There's some like Job, right, where it's, he's suffering and it's revealing character and the nature of God and what matters in this life. But we see that this is a far more complicated answer. And so he brings our attention to heinous, senseless acts that happen suddenly in the hands of people. Right? You can turn on your phone or turn on your computer or the TV this morning and see any number of examples of Right? Some that you would go, I can see myself in that moment and it bothers you more. Others that you want to quickly draw um, a rash conclusion about what they deserve it. Right? You need an example of that last like, Saturday night and Sunday morning, the club in Colorado Springs, right? Right? Like you can imagine that being the question asking, being asked here. Hey, Jesus, we heard about this thing that happened. Like, did they, did they deserve it? Did they not? due to their sin, like that's the question that's coming across, and it should make us feel uncomfortable. But to make sure that we understand that it's not just um, suffering at the hands of people, he continues. He 
tells them, listen, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Of the, and he goes in verse 4. Or what about those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? This, this wall, this tower outside of a, a pool or a well on the edge of Jerusalem. Right, and there's most likely some scaffolding, some repairs being done, and it fell. It's a natural disaster, right? It killed 18 people. He's like, do you think that God had initiated to make sure that the, the 18 worst people were there so they, they got the judgment? He's like, that they were the worst defenders and all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, he is not saying that their blood is going to be mixed with with their sacrifices, and they're going to have a tower fall on them. What is he saying? You too will meet an untimely end. You too eventually will perish, and you will die, and you will go before the Lord in judgment. That is going to happen at some point. You don't get to avoid it. At some point, there will be others who are alive who are talking about the way that you died. And in the moment, we're simply talking about them, but that moment is going to come for you as well. Right? It's, it's hard language. Um, I think about myself in this, when I, when I read or look through obituaries or hear someone that's roughly my age has passed away, what, I, what I'm looking for to find some level of comfort or security is I want to make sure what happened to them was unique. Right? That, that, that somehow there's a way that it's I'm not going to, that's not going to happen to me in my age, in my life circumstance, right? I'm looking for some, like, a, like, do they have some genetic thing, right? Was it suicide? Like, what, like is there something that can just be, okay, I don't have to worry about that happening to me. And, and listen, I know it's false comfort and it's false security, but we naturally do that. We look for it. And what Jesus is warning them and is teaching us this morning is this, is we cannot rush to judgment about why or presume why suffering has come into someone's life. We cannot say their suffering with that disease, with that sickness, with that circumstance, with that tragedy, with that accident, with that stuff, right? Well, whatever it is, whatever circumstances, because of sin in their life. And there's a tendency for us to say if there is um, suffering, then we assume guilt. And yet Jesus himself is going to go to Jerusalem and suffer. And it will not be due to his sin. Like he is an example that you can sin and not rightly deserve it. But on the flip side, we can also presume if there's a lack of suffering in my life, then I'm blessed. And God is approving of all that I'm doing. That too is dangerous. That, right? That just because there's not something terrible going on in our life, right? That, that God is affirming everything. So what do we begin to kind of glean from this section? The first is this, is that Jesus is teaching them tomorrow is not promised. Right? These men and women involved in these situations where they were killed while sacrificing, were not thinking that their death was going to happen. Those who are working or are in the, 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 just the vicinity of the Tower of Siloam were planning on going home that day. And yet it was terrible, it was sudden, that tomorrow is not promised. And it meant that these folks in both of these scenarios, right, if you want to think of other natural disasters, earthquakes in Haiti, hurricanes, like whatever you want to think of, they didn't have an opportunity for a deathbed confession. There wasn't one last opportunity to repent. And he's warning them, don't live your life Right, ignoring what God is calling you to do, believing there was always going to be another chance. There's always going to be another opportunity. There's always going to be a time for me to see what's coming, and it won't be sudden in my life, and I'll deal with Jesus then. He's like, you may not have that opportunity because tomorrow isn't promised. Life is brief, even if it lasts for 80, 90, 100 years. It is quick. You hear that over and over again. So Ecclesiastes taught us what? Live in light of the fact that you're going to die. If you can grasp that and then live backwards, that's going to occur. So how do I live in light of that? Right? And remind us, the race doesn't always go to the fastest. 
The smartest doesn't always have the most money. The strongest doesn't always win the fight. That life doesn't always go in a fair manner. We have to live in light of the fact that we're going to die. And yet our culture does everything it can to convince us that's not going to happen. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, we just see it succinctly said this way. And just as it is appointed for man or woman or for person to die once, and after that comes judgment. Right, that we know that death comes for everyone, and after death is judgment. And Jesus is warning them. Listen, set your accounts in order. Make things right with God before your death occurs. And you don't know when it's coming. Last week it was you don't know when the master's returning. When is the return of Christ? You also don't know when your death is coming. So the second thing is this. It's not just that tomorrow is a promise. It's that we have a need to repent. If you look, he says all, right? Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He is reminding us that he has come. Remember in Luke 5, 32, he says, I didn't come for the well, I came for the sick. To call them to repentance. And he's reminding us that we all have an issue. We all are separated from God. We're all rebels apart from him, separated and broken and needing redemption and restoration. We are separated from God, unable to make things right. And so then when we are separated from God, death is a legitimate enemy. Because in death it brings judgment because we're standing before God. So we fear death. We fear the separation that it brings. When he says perish, perish here is the opposite of salvation. Perish is dying apart from Christ, apart from hope, apart from salvation, where you walk into judgment alone. He's like, if you don't repent, you will perish. It's not just that you will die, but you will go before God and you will find judgment and wrath and condemnation. That is your end. It is promised, even if you don't know when it's coming. It is happening. And so, tomorrow is a promise. There is a need for all to repent. None of us escape that need. And the third thing, then, is this. Repent. Like, repent. And, and it, it, even though we're in a seemingly kind of harsh section of Luke, where Jesus is bringing a lot of difficult topics before us. Don't forget tender Jesus. Throughout when he sees the widow and her son is being walked out on the funeral pyre, right? Like has compassion on her and resurrects her son. The Jesus who sits down at the bed next to the young daughter of Jairus. Says, hey, like, sweetheart, wake up. Right? The, the one who is caring and tender. We have to hold both of these things in tension that Jesus is gracious and tender and compassionate and he sees us and he cares for us and he knows us and he is warning us. Repent. Repent. Because you will stand before God someday. Listen, this is Romans chapter 2 verse 4 and 5. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Right? Paul is saying, repent. Like God is being kind and gracious to you. Right? So that you will repent and see him rightly. And if you don't, you are storing up Wrath, additional wrath. So what is repentance here? It is turning from trusting in yourself or in any other thing other than God. To trusting in Him. It's seeing your sin rightly as damning, as separate as it is, it separates you, as it's war on God. And it's seeing God rightly as beautiful, as hope, 
is where all of our trust, our joy, our hope, our affection should be, is in Him. So it's turning from trusting in ourselves, or in the government, or in um, our, our intelligence, or in our giftings, or in our money, or in our health, or in any of these things, and it's trusting Jesus as sufficient. Because what does Satan do? What does Satan lie to us? He says this. There is hope and joy to be found apart from God. And you can find it going apart and away from Him. It's no longer trusting that, but it's believing and trusting <coughs> Him. Treasuring God rightly. And so Jesus is actually going to continue in this passage. Look he, in verse 6. And He told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. So he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And so we have this, this parable. And, and what we see in Scripture is this, is that the fig tree is symbolic of and represents the nation of Israel. Um, I'm going to read one passage to show this. This is Joel chapter 1, verse 7. Um, I'll start verse 6. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth. And it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. He's referring to judgment that's come on Israel. He says, they're my fig tree. Right? You can see this in Jeremiah 29, 17. Isaiah 34, 4. Micah 7, 1. Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 9. That the fig tree is symbolic of the nation of Israel. And so the parable that Jesus is teaching here is as a nation, he's saying, Israel, you're on the edge of judgment. You're on the edge of judgment. Like, you are deserving because you are fruitless. And you have been fruitless for a while, right? This, the, the gentleman's come for years now looking for fruit. Fig trees put off fruit every year. And every year, this, this fig tree is not producing fruit. Do you remember what John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3 as he's coming on the scene and pointing to Jesus? This is Luke 3, 8 and 9. He says, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So John the Baptist steps, like, steps in on the scene saying, Hey, I'm warning you, repent. Right? Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Repent. There's hope. Don't think that your blood, your nationality is going to save you. God can raise up the rocks and say, Those are my sons. Right? Repent. If you're not bearing fruit and keeping with repentance, you're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. And here Jesus is saying there's a, a fruitless fig tree, and it's been fruitless for a while. He, it's an evaluation of the nation's current spiritual status. They're fruitless. They're not bearing fruit. And so, if they don't produce quickly, judgment is coming. Listen, you're thinking this is a lot of dark, hard news in nine short verses. But I want you to notice some hope here. There's a window of opportunity. Because the man, when he said to the wine, to the vine dresser, look, I've done this for three years. I want to cut it down. The vine dresser says, no, 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 sir. One more year. And I'm going to loosen the dirt around the tree. And I'm going to put on fertilizer. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to give it some extra attention, extra focus. And listen, if it doesn't produce next year, I'll cut it down. But let's give it one more chance to produce fruit. It's a window of opportunity for repentance. We are seeing the character and the patience of God revealed here 
and saying, I've come and found you wanting and lacking. And I'm calling you to repentance. I'm calling you to know me and to trust me and to, to settle your accounts with me. Listen, the tree has done nothing to merit extra attention or focus or treatment. Folks, we've done nothing to merit grace or mercy from God. Nothing. We are utterly undeserving. And yet, Jesus stepped into history at the right time to bring restoration, and peace, and hope, and joy, to make us right with the Father. We are undeserving, and yet it is offered grace to us because of the merit of Jesus, not of ourselves. We read this passage a couple weeks back, but it's, it's fitting this morning. This is 2 Peter chapter 3 once again. As we consider the, the character of God, verses um, 8 and 9. Don't overlook this one fact, beloved. That with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's saying that is the character, the heart, the hope behind the Lord. And he's calling us to repentance, saying, You don't deserve it, you haven't merited it, you haven't earned it. But I'm giving you opportunity to be restored to right relationship with God. Would you own your sin and death before me and find that I've made a solution, a path of restoration in Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. So that you have this window of opportunity. I know a family who, um, when their kids are whining or complaining, um, which happens like apparently occasionally, um, the dad will typically the vehicle will holler out, what do you deserve? And he's taught his family this mantra over the years, and those, those kids will all yell back, Dad! <laughs> right? And all the dads are going, that's right, me too. Right? <laughs> and he goes, what do you get? And they all yell back, everything. Right? He's, he's, he's teaching them this gospel truth. What do we deserve? Nothing. We don't deserve anything. We deserve death. In Christ, what do we get? Everything. We are made sons and daughters of the King. We are brought in and we are told we belong. And we have a seat at the table, even though we're the crippled beggar, right? Although we're the filthy sinner, like that Jesus makes us right and whole. He comes and says to us, this is your seat. Here at the table, you are loved and wanted and you belong. There is hope and joy and peace eternally, everlasting for you. I've done what you could not do. I've made a path and I've restored you and I've made it right through my life and through my death and through my resurrection. Right? Like, this is what Jesus is trying to help them understand. And just like a parent can look harsh if, they, if their kid runs out in the street and a parent yells, right, to get the kid's attention, to keep them from danger, Jesus here is warning, saying, don't do this. It's going to lead to you perishing. But repent. Repent. Trust me. And all of this is before you. The kingdom is before you. Church, here's the danger for us as we wrap up this morning. The Western world is discipling and conditioning us to believe that we are owed longevity of life, wealth, ease, and comfort. And that if we don't get it, that God's mad at us. We are not owed those things. We are in a unique era of history where an inordinate amount of people have gained them. And it doesn't mean that God is pleased with them. And it doesn't mean if you don't get them that God is displeased with you. We will all face death and judgment. Are we doing it with Jesus or apart from him? So it means that this isn't our home. Right? That we're headed home. And this isn't our kingdom. We're headed to our kingdom where there is no more death. There is no more sin. There are no more tears. There are no more sickness or separation or pain or suffering. We have hope and peace and joy. 
And so, on this side of heaven, on this side of judgment, on this side of God, meeting him face to face, your suffering is not wasted. It is not for naught. And so, it may be that it's an opportunity for you to repent. As you're reminded, I will one day perish. This isn't fun. I'm going to perish. I'm going to repent. It can be that your suffering is an opportunity for you to reveal that your hope isn't in this world. And when everything has gone wrong and it doesn't look right, and you're going, I'm trusting and hoping in Jesus, and he is sufficient, even though this life has been hard and difficult for decades. Jesus is enough for me. He has sustained me in the midst of circumstances that others believe that they would crumble under. It could be that he is refining us, helping us let go of things that we have held on to tightly, who are attempting to take our attention and energy from him. And then when you hear Paul say this, this is 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 7, he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay, right? When you hear jars of clay, you don't think sturdy, right? Something fragile. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Right? He's saying this life hasn't gone the way you might write it to be, or want it to be, or long for it to be, but Jesus has been sufficient. He has been enough. So go to verse 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, and whether you believe it or not today, regardless of your age, your outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, though it will pass away, Right? But the things that are unseen are eternal. He's saying, look at Jesus, not at your circumstances. Look at him. He will put you on solid ground. He will sustain you. He will comfort you. Your circumstances don't dictate, right? Your suffering doesn't dictate how God feels about you. The cross does. That Jesus has said, I love you. And I've given you a way forward. I've given you a path of restoration with God through my life, my death, and my resurrection. And so this season, and why we went here this morning, is we're celebrating that Jesus has come. He's come with hope and peace and joy and love. And he is returning for his bride, the church. Where our faith will be made sight. Where we will find that all the things of this life, as difficult, as long-lasting as they were, will feel light and momentary compared to the surpassing weight of glory that awaits us. And Jesus will sustain us until then. And so the call upon us this is this. is to repent. Jesus has come on a rescue mission to defeat our enemies, sin and Satan and death, and to take us back where we belong, in right relationship with the Father. And you want to summarize this passage, God looks and we are found lacking. There's a window of opportunity of mercy. Thus, repent. Trust, turn and trust Jesus. And you will bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That fruit is not your salvation. It is not what gets you saved it is evidence that Jesus is yours and that you are his. So we are bearing fruit, keeping with repentance. So this morning, if there are things that are tight in your grip, right, when Jesus, would you just hand them over? Right, that you would repent, even if you know Jesus, you would repent, I've trusted in things other than you. I've hoped in things other than you. God, I don't want that. I want you. Maybe this morning for the first time you're going, I've never repented. I've never trusted. I've never turned. The opportunity is there for you to hear Jesus just say, I want you. You're mine. 
My life is sufficient for you. My death is sufficient for you. And I have proven that all my promises are true in my resurrection and my ascension. So there will be some men and women in the back of the room. If you need someone to talk to, to pray with, um, to, to talk more about what repentance would look like, they're back there for that. Or for any other thing that you might need to talk to or pray about. Um, the band's going to come back up and we're going to sing to our King. Asking for affection to be stirred, that the things of this world would begin to fade away, would begin to fall off, and that we would see more clearly the kingdom that we are headed to, the home that we are headed to, and that Jesus is sufficient to get us there. Let's pray. Father, would you remove the scales from our eyes. God, would you take away the stony, hard, cold hearts of sin that have trusted in anything and everything but you? God, would we no longer believe the lie that there is joy or that there is pleasure that's eternal and lasting apart from you? God, we would find our cup overflowing if we walk with you. And that you are more than enough. You will sustain us. God, would we see a hard passage like this and in the end walk away going, Jesus is beautiful. Thank you for unmerited mercy and grace. Thank you for opportunity to repent, to know you. So God, would you move in us now to repent where necessary, to trust and to delight in you. In Jesus' name.
is one. It says, and so from the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. <laughs>
we all we all need hope, don't we? And thank you that Christ is born. I tell you what, it's still Sunday. We still have a whole another day to spend with our families and rest and take a nap and eat some leftovers. So everybody enjoy that. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 